It's time to go into business for yourself. Get ready for another episode of the Franchise Academy Podcast. Education, insight, and inspiration. Here's your host, small business and franchise expert, Tom Scarda. Welcome to another episode of the Franchise Academy. My name is Tom Scarda, and this is the place to come for everything franchising. If you listened to the show before, you know I'm a franchise consultant. I match people with opportunities based on skills, personality, goals, kind of like the e-harmony of business is what I like to call it. And I work with folks that are frustrated with their career, people that um, cringe at the thought of going to work in the morning. I work with folks that really want to change their lifestyle. And other people want to just diversify their investments. So I don't know if, uh, if you love your job or not, but if you're having issues, we should probably have a conversation. If you're thinking about franchising, we should definitely talk. I have a whole educational platform that will help you make the proper decision for you, your family, and your future, not to mention the community that you'll open up in. I'm excited for this podcast. I have a special guest, Mike, to, <laughs> not um, Tabasco, but how do you say it, Mike? Go ahead. It's Tabasco. I wasn't going to help you with that, Tom. Oh, you, you were making – I was dangling, man. Oh, my God. Thank you so much, Mike. Mike is a VP of Muya Burgers, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, planning for post-pandemic, how he helped his franchisees through the pandemic, and some things that are hot topics in restaurant franchising right now. So, Mike, welcome to the Franchise Academy. Tom, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's so great to have somebody with your breadth of experience. You've been around the block more than once in food franchises. Yep. So um, what's happening at Muya? What, what are you most excited about right now in the franchise? Well, as we sit here today and, you know, things can change, you know, but we're, in a, we're really in a pretty good spot. We've got 100% of our restaurants to this point from what was really pretty bleak on March 12th. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 100% of the folks that applied for PPP funding got it. Um, the folks that um, are open and can legally be open are open, and they're productive members in the community. So it's, uh, it's really been a strange, unique, scary, fun, and exciting time, you know, for us. Yeah. And, uh, God bless. You know, we, we've had uh, – we're, we're blessed with tremendous partners. So that is every bit to say with those guys that own these restaurants. How many franchises uh, do you have open and operating right now? We're, we're, we're 80 restaurants, and that's, I, I think, kind of what got us there. The way Muya's built is it's not one 80 restaurant company. It, we are 80 very unique, separate restaurants, and that's the way you build this thing is one at a time. So yeah. Yeah, it, the number's 80 as we sit here. Um, you know, we've got uh, actually number 80 opened uh, two weeks ago in the middle of this stuff in Brentwood, Tennessee. Oh, Wow. Yeah, very exciting. And and I think, you know, franchise or I shouldn't I should say food owners, food restaurants, franchise or not, actually uh kind of saved us in the pandemic. Uh if if you were you know, if you had a drive through or if you were operating through one of the food delivery app services, um, you guys did a fabulous job, really. I'm really grateful for it. Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we had started an initiative back in 2019 to try and embrace the uh, third-party delivery segment of the business. Oh, yeah. um, you know, th those are not the most profitable sales. It, it, for all of us, it's still dying in very much so. And um, we had those relationships in place. And I can tell you is that since March 12th, that's been our absolute lifeblood. If we didn't have that, and, and I'll also go back to, we had a couple of very strong-willed hobbyists that were doing curbside delivery programs. One, our marketing team pivoted and was very nimble and got a world-class program out in front of everybody quickly. But yeah, I, life is absolutely completely different as we sit here uh, in the first week of June versus where we were the second week of March. Very oh, much goodness. So. Night and day. I mean, I didn't know if we would see June back in March. Yeah, us too. Us too. Yeah, it was it was crazy, but but we adjusted, man. Just like you know, Americans do, no matter what happens. And and I knew that we would overcome. And and uh, and now we're seeing the light at the end end of the tunnel. Even here in New York, where I live, we're starting to do some uh, outdoor dining. Right. Uh, so it's it's good. It's really good. I'm excited about it. So, 
Um, so I think there's a love-hate relationship with the third-party delivery services. Am I speaking out of turn on that? No, n- not at all. I mean, I remember a guy came into my restaurant 20 years ago and told me he would deliver my food for 40%. And it didn't take me long to throw that guy out, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, restaurants are not a, a high-margin uh, you know, enterprise by their very nature. You know, they're capital intensive. And um, we were very skeptical as we saw what the fee structures were for, for all these various groups. And then, you know, to, to add fuel to that fire, Amazon exits it. You know, that's one thing they can do is deliver things. And they jumped out of that, that's out of right. that business model, right? So the question about third-party delivery is, is it cannibalizing your existing sales? Is someone going to choose to not dine in where it's profitable? And that's what we're all built to do is take care of guests in our house. Um, or is this an incremental sale? And what we learned in, in 2018 is that it's absolutely an incremental sale. If you're not doing it, your competitor is. So you need to be in that boat. And as long as you're not adding incremental labor to service that, it fits your economic model. And 2018 was a time of big change, I know, for our company because our economic model was frankly broken. We had a lot of things uh, on the menu that probably didn't belong there. Muya is a quality brand and uh, – you know, if, if you're doing chicken and doing all this other stuff, um, nobody knows what you're best in the world at. Right. So we, we got our economic model in order back in 2018. We really benefited from that in 2019. And we were ready for the incremental sales piece that comes with third-party delivery. Not saying that's the right path for everybody, but it certainly worked for us. So we come into March where I remember March 9th, we were cooking along with the comp sales. March 10th, not quite as great. March 11th, we were flat, and then the bottom fell out on March 12th, right? And, um, you know, it, I've never seen an event like that in my 30 years in the industry. Fortunately, people need to eat, and those of us that could stay open and legally could, you know, continue to serve the, our communities, we're in a position to do that, but just not as profitably as we had done it on Monday. Now that we're sitting here on Thursday with our doors closed and, uh, you know, capacity restrictions. So, yeah, it's been a key component if we didn't have those guys. Um, but we've absolutely had to rethink how we're servicing those paths in very limited space. I mean, Amuya runs between 1,400 and 2,400 square feet. Yeah. And th- that's a completely different experience. It's built for speed versus what we were built to do is take care of folks in our house. And uh, we had to get a lot better uh, at that model much more quickly, right? But, uh, you know, where we were able to stay open, it was in large part because of these third-party delivery vendors. Yeah, I don't think you could have survived without it. And and so, but it's a love-hate relationship because you kind of you kind of need them. It's a necessary evil. And by evil, I mean they charge really steep fees. And yeah. I don't think people realize that. I think they think that the restaurant is still getting 100% of that check that they're ordering. Oh, there's, there's been a couple of workarounds. Uh, obviously, Grubhub, DoorDash, you know, and I'm not calling anybody out on that. They want their 25 to 30%, whatever you can negotiate. But uh, it, it's really who's paying that. Is it the end user? Is it your guest? Is it your customer? Or is it the, the business owner? So we've been able to uh, uh, get a third-party system in that actually directs guests to our sites and uh, we, we get that sale, and then the delivery charges are passed on to the guests. So that's helped our economic model. We're trying to transition more towards that. That way, the third-party delivery group still gets their money. Um, our franchise owners are still taken care of. And we've seen a shift as we've been more successful marketing that avenue into our business. But uh, when it first started off, uh, what we had to do as a franchisor is figure out what can we afford to do. So our board and our president day two of this said, we're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. What's this look like for us? How long can we sustain? Because I mean, I'm telling you, sales were cut in half just overnight. That's not sustainable. Um, The first thing that came out of their mouths were, we're a franchise organization, which means we're a support organization. Layoffs are not on the table. We're only 17 people to service these 80 franchise partners. And if we're not here for them, they have nowhere else to turn. So layoffs are off the table. What else can we afford to do? 
uh, we figured within the first couple of weeks that we could sustain where we currently were, a neutral cash flow position. And by the way, there was no PPP yet at this point in time. We were all trying to navigate the SBA idle portals and all that stuff and re really struggling to get through there. And we just kind of gave all 17 people a purpose. It, it, there's a partner out there somewhere that needs you. Let's get connected with these guys. And then um, a couple of weeks go by, there's rumors of PPP, but we're not sure if that's going to happen. If you remember back that far. And, um, it seems like 10 years ago, it was a couple months. <laughs> I was just going to say that. It seems like years ago. We were uh, in a position where we could defer some royalties. And then the big thing we did, realizing that these guys are the ones bearing the brunt of third-party delivery, was that we'll, we'll pick up the tab for that out of our oh, marketing wow. funds. So huge, we were able to offer free delivery. We just ended that as we've seen our sales trends really turn around. And because we were able to do that, I think our, our turnaround's been more quick. We, we, we've for sure seen some guests that weren't familiar with who Muya was, um, you know, pre-pandemic. There's no doubt about that. We were open, other people weren't. Um, so they tried us via third-party delivery. And now they're coming into the restaurants as these dining rooms reopen. So how, I got a couple of questions around all of that stuff, but how are you handling the reopening? Are you, um, are you spacing out people in the restaurant and doing all that kind of stuff? For sure. Um, you know, first state open was Texas and uh, it was right there with Georgia and all these other things. We've got a, a project under construction in Georgia, but it didn't necessarily apply to what was going on in Texas. So the first thing we do, as a restaurant organization, as an organization of people, is it has to be done safely. And we've learned an awful lot. Uh, so while we were still in the third party business, week one, we called for a national clean the house day for all restaurants. We got some traction with that on LinkedIn and Facebook and some other things, but Muya called for that. It came from our, our uh, actually our supply chain group and said, we've got to rebuild trust with folks. People are scared. We've got to be safe. We've got to be clean. And we learned a lot of things about what clean really looks like, right? Everybody uses quaternary sanitizer. Well, that's not necessarily totally effective against coronavirus. It's, it, it's a very uh, succinct and distinct uh, methodology you have to apply to that stuff. So we've changed to a peroxide base and um, sanitizer, had to get that in, had to get the right instructions, and we had to coach, teach, and train everybody what that looks like. So now we get into the reopening. And, uh, you know, we, a muya seats between 50 and 100 people typically. And you're telling me I can seat between 12 and a half people and 25 people now. What does that look like for dining purposes? Yeah. And um, there are plenty of places that kind of winked at that rule. And I don't think that's the right way to go for the public. There, there's a reason that we've devastated this economy. So we had to coach, teach, and train and make someone responsible for the social distancing efforts. Now, as I, I realize in New York, where you are, you're, you're, you're just starting that process of the reopening. We've had about a month of it now. And uh, it, it's been good. Once you're, once you're on top of it, from the get-go and you have a good plan of what it should look like, but you're not screaming at anybody to, you know, not step on anybody's toes or anything like that. You treat folks like guests. It's been a very respectful environment and it's absolutely helped. Uh, absolutely. It's helped, helped our sales and it's helped our, our bottom lines for sure. I think it's, this is not disinfectant theater the way some people call it, like security at the airport is just theater. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Correct. It can't be. It, it just can't be tough. It can't be because it'll it'll come back to bite you. Yeah. Um, the the only experience I've had so far is uh, I was driving back from Denver last week and we stopped in a Cracker Barrel in in Gary, Indiana, of all places, <laughs> and um, I was totally impressed and blown away by the way they handled the customers. They use the they use the tables sort of like a checkerboard. Yep. So there's like two tables. They not only after the guest left, they not only clean the table, they sanitize that thing, top, bottom, chairs, everything, and then they use the table next to it for the next guest, and then vice versa. So I felt totally comfortable. And then they had. Um, the, the person, there's only one person that can touch the plates of food. 
you can't, you know, there's no condiments on the table, which I found really just weird. But yeah. that's what you need to have, right? Um, and everything was like single serving packets. It was just really weird, but it worked. And I was grateful. That was the first day in 73 days I was able to sit down and <laughs> dine in. Yeah. You missed it, didn't you? Oh, my God. We all did. Absolutely. Who was it? That somebody just said, um, oh, somebody was talking about the fitness industry and like, oh, people are just going to, you know, get a Peloton and, and work out at home. And, uh, and the gentleman said, well, everybody has a kitchen, but they still go out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be yeah. frank. I, I learned how to bake bread doing this. I was one of the guys buying all the yeast for yeah. sure. And I've got some if you need any, Tom, but I, I, I didn't corner the market on it, I promise. <laughs> it's funny how a lot of people, even like my wife who hasn't baked a cake in like years, all of a sudden she's baking cakes and doing all sorts. Like what else you got to do, right? I, I put on 15 pounds in the past two months. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. But you bring up the, the fact that um, it, it's changed. You know, we're fast casual brand and uh, – I guess can no longer walk into a muya and fill up their own drink, and that's by design. But it's it's also given us some opportunities to be more hospitable and, and give us some some more service um, service driven initiatives that are yeah everybody's accustomed to walking into muya and getting twenty seven napkins for the burger. You know, <laughs> personally, I, I've got it down to eighteen. They're great burgers. Um, but now we have to give you those napkins and, uh, we don't want somebody doing a napkin at a time. We've had to be really smart on this and it, it, what's appropriate. Ketchup can't be there. We've got a single portion. If you want a refill, we'll be happy to get that for you. Um, right. It, it, it's, uh, it's been very opportunistic, a great opportunity for our brand to really get our best foot forward and, it, and be better stewards of a, of a guest experience. But yeah, it's different. It's, it's certainly different. You know, it's I, so I congratulate you guys for for taking it and and you know and doing something positive with this experience, because there's some people who just kind of threw their hands up and and walked away. Yeah. Um, I know there's a couple of restaurant tours in New York City. They they close their doors. and ain't never going back. Um, yeah, I've heard twenty five percent will will be gone, and that's not great. It's not an opportunity there's those of us that love this industry and love this business don't want to see that happen for anyone it's a highly competitive business but at the end of the day uh, my customer isn't necessarily the end user my customers my franchise partners right. and i've got a lot of guys that have everything on the line here and uh, that's what gets us up every morning I, I loved your intro when you were saying if you hate your job see i i, I don't need a franchise I, <laughs> i've got franchisees i love what i do every day and, and we've got a team of folks that do that but you know um we, we've uh, we've had some very stern conversations with folks you know i'll, I'll share with you what, what i think's been the biggest change for us in terms of the way we look at the business Tom, is um you're an ops guy i'm an ops guy and we grew up reading p l's right that's how you impact change. It's your report card. You, you know where to scratch, where it itches on your uh, mm -hmm. on your profitability by reading a P&L. And March 12th, that changed. We all became masters of income statements and cash flow because cash has been king. And you can have a great system where you manage the P&L, the cash will be there. That changed March 12th. We, 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 and, I'll, and I'll recommend for anyone, Khan Academy's got a great cash flow statement and income statement uh, uh, free class that you can take on it because I had to have all of our multi-unit guys take a peek. Um, you know, this is not a part of the business that most operators really particularly look at, but now we're looking at cash with our franchise partners on a weekly basis. And then, you know, with what's happened with PPP, they keep moving the goalposts on that thing. Right. Um, right. It, it, it's been interesting, but uh, you know, I'll tell you, we're not one of those brands that had to return any money because we absolutely needed it to survive. Of course. Uh, you know, Muya, the franchisor, the, the company, is a small business. Uh, we don't have access to capital markets. Not one of our partners, not one of the 80 restaurants out there had access to the capital markets. And when we, we were almost 100% shut out in that first round, um, pretty frustrating and scary times. But uh, we were able to, to pivot off of that. And uh, yeah, I think we were 15% funded to that first round. And then uh, 
we kept everybody in a portal. We found some local options for most folks, and that's where we prefer to do it. If there's anybody on that's listening that's uh, considering taking it, we recommend you go local first. But uh, there are some national brands out there. Uh, 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 Apple Pie Capital is one that I, I could throw that was a tremendous help to us in getting the folks that just didn't have options. And like I said, no one had access to the, to the street or to um, a rich uncle. I mean, we really needed that. And now it's transitioning into how do we get this maximized for forgiveness, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of wheat and chaff out there in terms of what's real news and what's the real guidance from the Treasury Department. Right. So, you know, what we learned last week is great news. They've taken the 75% payroll uh, uh, mandate down to 60%. Well, at 75%, if you took it to 70, you only had to pay back 5% or the 30%, right? Now they're saying if you don't spend 60%, you have to pay it all back. Uh-huh. So what we're working with our partners on is ensuring maximum forgiveness. Uh, you know, th- there's been a lot of good that came out of the last guidance and, and, and the last bill change on the PPP that the president signed on Friday is that um, we get 24 weeks now instead of eight to, to manage the payrolls. There's some uh, folks that are dealing with this now, uh, the, the full-time equivalent piece where you have to really hold on to your people. We're all trying to do that anyway. We know that, that, that we need to hold on to our people. Uh, but that, that's been good. And that's... Uh, it's it just navigating it. And I think the b- best service we can do in support of our franchise partners is making sure they have real information. They've got the real, da- the real deal and the real data. And we've had to really leverage some partners to make sure we're accurate when we're getting these guys to move forward with their business. Uh, we've leveraged our auditor who we hate those guys, but man, have they been good friends, you know, at this point in time, our auditors have been, been fantastic in terms of getting us uh, really good guidance and advice. And We've been able to send that out to the system. So what, what I hear you saying is that this whole COVID thing actually gave you guys a chance to take a breath and then really hone your system and, and your P&L like to the nth degree, right? Well, if our 2017 P&L uh, was in place when we got here, when, when March 12th happened, you'd be talking to somebody else today. We had to fix that economic model. I mean, that's what a franchise is. It's an investment, right? right? And if you don't have that going in, nobody got rich since March. No, nobody's making a zillion dollars, but our, our, our job was to protect the investment. So, you know, <laughs> safety first, got to get their financials right. And that was a transition from P&L based to cash flow based. Cash is king. Um, the federal stimulus piece was huge. And then as we're open, we had to really market it our marketing team was incredibly nimble. And once again, I'm an ops guy. I'm not predisposed to really enjoying marketing folks, but uh, <laughs> our, our team's wonderful. I got to give them total props. They, they, uh, they, they really came up with some very good local stuff. What, what, uh, what you need in Bluebell, Pennsylvania is not what you need in Fort Worth, Texas and not what you need in Hickory Creek, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it, everybody got very customized stuff and had we been like a lot of folks and said you know the easy thing to do here is lay folks off i don't think we're talking that we're coming out of this right pretty much unscathed yeah no i think um you know and and the other part of it in my opinion and i I don't know if you guys took advantage of it was really just the support from the international franchise association yep um you know people don't realize that when i was a new franchise owner back in the day i didn't realize the breadth of experience and the people willing to help franchise companies and individual franchise owners be successful. It's like we're in this together and, you know, the, the, when the tide rises, everybody's boat floats. And um, it's an incredible industry, very unlike corporate America where, oh, for sure. For sure. where there's no help anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the most case, no one's trying to trick anybody out here. You know, it, 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 you're just trying to give good, honest, hard-working folks a path forward to to be part of something that's bigger than them, something that's really cool and something they're proud of. Uh, great call-out on the IFA. We absolutely used them, and they gave us some terrific information. Yeah. Uh, you know, March 14th, I was uh, – curled up in the fetal position trying to figure out what our next move was. And they were saying, Hey, here's what we're hearing. Here's what we're working on. And uh, absolutely an excellent resource for us. Yeah. Great call. Yeah. yeah. Really good stuff. I mean, I, when this was all going down, 
that that week I was actually in uh, Park City, Utah at the um, Unconference. I don't know if you know. Uh, oh yeah. Lane Fisher and and um, Fisher Zuckman, the the attorneys, and and uh, Brad Fishman, who is uh, Fishman PR, which is a big PR firm for franchising. They put together this conference, but the government relations director was at the conference and she was reporting to us like on an hourly basis what was going on on the floor in congress and and we had the ifa had people there in washington i mean they're based in washington but they were in washington dealing with the congress people and the senators and 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 saying look at this is what we're going to need as restaurant owners or as business owners you know, we span some 90 industries in franchising. So just, I'm just trying to let people know that are listening that a franchise is more than just, you know, you're walking into your, your local burger joint that happens to be a franchise. It's so much grander than that. So much support comes with it. And, and that's what makes franchising great. It really does. Sure. Yeah, it's more than just whatever playbook you're currently executing, for sure. A lot of resources out there and a lot of folks that, that want you to be successful. Yeah. yeah. In your opinion, what would you say to somebody who's listening and they're thinking about getting into a franchise right now? Um, because, you know, after the pandemic, they might be out of a job. Yeah. Um, what would you say to somebody that's thinking about it? Um, well, f figure out something that you're passionate about. I, I tell you, at least half of ours were our customer before they were our franchisees. Mm -hmm. They came into Amuya. Uh, the other half, we're looking for an investment, and um, both of those things have to go hand in hand. Am I passionate about it, and can I uh, see a reasonable return? You've got to do your homework on the, on those fronts. So, the, I mean, I think everybody can get really excited early on when they're looking at a brand and be, be just passionate about it, but you've got to do your diligence and make sure that the investment's going to return. Um, and, and I just want to clarify, like, you know, when you say passion, it doesn't mean that I love hamburgers, so that's Right. Why should own a Muya? That's right. a mistake for a lot, of, a lot of people make. Yeah, I love hamburgers, and uh, not all hamburgers are created equal. I'm I'm, I'm qualified to pass that on, but yeah, uh, yeah for sure, you find a brand that you're really passionate about or, right. or, or interested in, and then really just uh, check the boxes. Right. I mean, how's it going to work for me? You have to be passionate about the day-to-day -day operation. You got to be willing to wake up in the morning and do what it takes to run that business, whether it's a Muya or any other franchise right. in any other in industry. Yep. Yeah, you've got that exactly right. Um, take a take take a good look at uh, what it is you want to be part of, right. and then understand what your life will look like in that system. And uh, that's why I'm confident saying, please shop Muya against anybody you want to shop in terms of quality of life, financial returns, whatever you want to look at, uh, quality, please shop us. And uh, if we're including the conversation, I'll be seeing you soon enough. Right, so, right. No, yeah. that's fantastic. And yeah. it's good. So that, that's a good segue to um, what's the best way to find out more about Muya, where they're located, maybe, uh, you know, your franchisees and franchise information. Well, I'm always available to take that call when somebody's reaching out. Um, but the, 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 as you know, the name's not the easiest name in the world. But uh, www.muya.com uh, will we'll, we'll get you in touch with me or uh, Taylor Powell or any of our other folks. We, uh, we don't farm that out to other people. It, it, it's a people business. It's a relationship business. and yeah. uh, it, It's orientation from the get-go. Worst thing that can happen is uh, someone get really far into the road and find out this is not something they, they wanted it to be. Um, that's where disappointment happens when expectation and reality don't meet up. So we try and get that out of the way early. Just say, what are your expectations? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a restaurant. It's not a printing press. There's stuff that there's a playbook we got to execute. And then, and then it, and then it goes great. If uh, you want to do your own burger place or you, you think I need a chicken sandwich, we're probably not for you. Uh, but if you want to execute a high quality brand and, and that type of stuff, hit us at uh, muya.com and, uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Mike Sabasco in the, uh, in the universe apparently right now. So uh, <laughs> be more than happy to talk to folks about uh, what our opportunities look like. Absolutely. That's awesome. And so um, last question to wrap it up. You bet. Can you, um, 
define one lesson that you learned from this great pandemic? You know, I've had a hundred lessons, um, you know, the, and I touched on the P and L move to the uh, cash flow and in, in the income statement. Um, but I'll tell you what I learned is just how, how nimble folks are and how much nonsense has absolutely gone away when you have real life partners with their backs against the wall. That uh, I, I, my, my biggest learning is I got 17 people and 80 owners that I want in my foxhole. Mm. Um, I, I, I didn't realize we were going to war together, but maybe we should, we should all understand that. I thought we were in business together. I thought we were partners, but if, if it ever breaks out, uh, my, my biggest takeaway is I am blessed and proud to be with, with the folks that we have on, uh, on this team. Uh, I, I can't sing enough praises for them, and that goes to our partners. I, I, I've got a bunch of faces popping in my head right now, and I, I want to hug them all because they really, really fought the good fight. That is continue awesome. to do so. That's my takeaway. That's awesome. Are, are you kidding me? We're already out of time? How yeah, can man. I be? We're flying. Time flies when you're having fun at the Franchise Academy. <laughs> great stuff, Tom. Really good. So, Mike, I appreciate your time, man. This was absolutely wonderful. Great insights. You're a rock star in the franchise world, so I appreciate your your guidance and, and your wisdom. Tom, thank you for having me. It was a blast. Absolutely. And uh, check out the franchiseacademy.com for further information on Muya Muya Burgers, and it's uh, www.muya.com. And we'll see you guys next time. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. This has been another episode of the Franchise Academy Podcast. For more info, go to our website, thefranchiseacademypodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Tom Scarta's YouTube channel for educational videos on franchising, education, insight, and inspiration.